Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to another edition of Crimes of the Week International. Authorities in the Australian city of Brisbane say that a young mother and several other victims have been left feeling extremely on edge this week after they were the targets of terrifying and brazen daylight home invasions that were allegedly carried out by the same two perpetrators. According to reports, the crimes all took place within just a couple of hours on March 26th when the two male suspects attempted to enter multiple properties in the area. Each time, they were wearing balaclavas and were armed with an axe and a crowbar. The first crime happened just before noon, when the men burst into a home in the Brisbane suburb of Paddington. At the time, a three-year-old girl and her grandmother were inside, though thankfully, it appears that they were not injured. After hitting a couple more properties nearby, the men drove a stolen vehicle to an address in the suburb of Hamilton, arriving at around 1 p.m. However, it was here that they seemingly got more than they bargained for. Upon breaking into the residence, the armed men were confronted by the female homeowner who was inside with her toddler. The mother proceeded to scream so loudly at the intruders that they fled in a panic. Honestly, I can't say I blame them. The audio of that encounter was partially recorded on the home CCTV system. Here's a clip to give you an idea. The suspects were in such a rush to get away, in fact, that one of them slipped and fell on the front deck of the home while running to escape. The men then drove away in a stolen Toyota. At the time of this recording, police say that they are still on the hunt for the two suspects, though it appears that they do know their identities. Apparently, the perpetrators are well known to authorities and were out on bail for similar crimes at the time of this week's incidents. Right now, no information has been released about how much was stolen during the home invasions, However, according to the victims, they believe these men were casing the area while pretending to be trade workers a couple of days before the crimes. The situation is still developing. Representatives from Ethiopia's largest commercial bank have issued a warning to hundreds of its customers this week, following an embarrassing glitch earlier this month that allowed customers to take out large sums of money that didn't belong to them, resulting in millions going missing within a matter of hours. The whole thing started sometime on March 15th, when a glitch began affecting ATMs belonging to the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia. The state-owned bank is the largest of its kind in the country, with roughly 38 million people having accounts there. While it was initially reported that the source of the glitch was a suspected cyber attack, bank officials have since come out and said that they now believe it was the result of a routine system update and inspection. What everyone seems to agree on, though, is what the glitch actually did. It allowed customers to withdraw more money than what was in their account from ATMs. As you might imagine, the situation spiraled out of control on March 16th after word started to spread that people were able to withdraw large sums of cash that didn't belong to them. Large lines began to form at CBE ATMs, with bank officials placing particular blame on university students who posted viral clips about the situation on TikTok, encouraging others to go out and get the free money as well. While the glitch was shut down in a matter of hours, authorities estimate that nearly 500,000 transactions took place during that time. The amount lost was initially reported to be in the neighborhood of $40 million US. However, bank officials have since disputed this, saying that only a fraction of the banking activity during this time was actually fraudulent. They estimate that around $14 million was lost, claiming that around 11 of it has so far been recovered. The cash apparently started being returned after Ethiopian authorities put out messages stating that those who did not fork over the money would be prosecuted. Even so, it appears that quite a few people have so far decided to try and hold on to the money anyway, with bank officials responding this week by publishing the names of more than 500 people in an apparent attempt to shame them into giving the money back. At the time of this recording, the situation is still developing. People across Ecuador are reportedly outraged and in mourning this week after the country's youngest mayor was found dead alongside a member of her team in what police say was a brutal murder. 
the disturbing case began on March 23rd, when family members reported that 27-year-old Bridget Garcia was missing. A search was launched, one which ended in tragedy just hours later when Garcia's rental car was found in the early morning hours of March 24th. Garcia was dead inside along with her communications director, Jairo Luor. Both of them had died from gunshot wounds, which authorities say were fired from inside the vehicle. Adding further tragedy to the situation is that the crime took place in the town of San Vicente, where Garcia was elected just last year, making her the country's youngest mayor. Prior to her murder, she had been trying to bring clean drinking water to her constituents and was working with a development bank to build infrastructure. While few other details about the crime are available at the time of this recording, many have speculated that the killings are related to Ecuador's ongoing and out-of-control situation with organized crime related to the drug trade. If you recall from previous reports we've done on the country, Garcia would be far from the first politician to be the victim of such a crime. Two other mayors have been killed within Manabi province alone since February of 2023. And in August of last year, a presidential candidate was assassinated as he left a campaign rally in the capital of Quito. You might also remember that just a couple of months ago in January, the president of Ecuador, Daniel Noboa, declared a state of emergency following the escape of one of the nation's most notorious gang leaders from a prison in Guayaquil. At the time of this recording, authorities are still investigating Garcia's murder and have not officially named any suspects. That being said, the Ecuadorian Ministry of Government has promised to stop at nothing to get justice, releasing a statement saying that they plan to, quote, use all force of the state to not leave these crimes unpunished. Representatives from England's Warwickshire police say that a local woman has been sentenced to jail time this week several days after she assaulted two fast food workers and twice as many police officers during an apparent meltdown for no discernible reason. The whole thing started at around 8.30 p.m. on March 21st, when Warwickshire police were called to a McDonald's location at the Junction 1 retail park in the town of Rugby. Officers were told that a woman, later identified as 32-year-old Joanna Davies, had been causing trouble in the restaurant and had attacked two members of their staff. According to witnesses, after walking into the restaurant, Davies approached a female employee who was on break, telling her that she was beautiful and attempting to hug her. She then stole the employee's hat, and when the woman asked to be left alone, Davies pushed her up against a wall. The unhinged attack continued when the 32-year-old began yelling threats and abuse at another employee, punching him in the face when he tried to intervene. She was then removed from the restaurant by her own group of friends. When police arrived at the scene, they found Davies across the street at another fast food place, where they told her that she was under arrest. However, rather than coming quietly, she proceeded to bite, spit at, and fight the officers. She also bizarrely began screaming, Warrant, as police took her to the ground, placed her in handcuffs, and put a spit hood on her head. Unbelievably, the ordeal wasn't over even after officers managed to get Davies into a police van. According to reports, she began slamming her head into the roof of the vehicle until she broke part of it, injuring herself in the process. When police took the 32-year-old to a local hospital for treatment, she apparently used the opportunity to try and fight them one more time, bringing the total number of officers she attacked up to four. This week, Davies was convicted on two charges of common assault, one charge of criminal damage, and another four charges of common assault against a police officer. She was sentenced to 32 weeks in jail and was also ordered to pay £200 in compensation. Unfortunately, at the time of this recording, no explanation has been provided for Davies' strange and violent behavior. Authorities in the Malaysian state of Sabah say that they are investigating a tragic murder case this week after a young student was allegedly beaten to death by his roommates in the dormitory of his school during an argument over a small amount of money and a phone charger. According to reports, the disturbing situation began just before 7 a.m. on March 22nd, when 17-year-old Mohamed Azwan was found unresponsive in the dorm where he lived at Lahad Datu Vocational College. Medical personnel were quickly called to the scene. However, 
Sadly, the teen was pronounced dead a short time later. Owing to obvious signs of trauma to several parts of Aswan's body, police were called, who launched an investigation. This led to the arrest of 13 male students in the dorm, all of whom are between the ages of 16 and 19. While the case remains speculative at this time, according to local media sources, it's believed that Aswan was confronted and attacked by several of his classmates after some sort of misunderstanding involving a phone charger. The nature of this misunderstanding is unclear, though other reports state that several of those allegedly involved believed that Aswan had stolen 85 Malaysian ringgit from them, or about $18 US. Still others suggested that the whole incident might have had more to do with bullying. At the time of this recording, the suspects remain in custody while the investigation continues. No formal charges have yet been laid. Authorities in Japan's Fukushima prefecture say that a local man has been arrested this week after he allegedly admitted to starting a forest fire last month, offering a bizarre reason behind the crime. According to reports, the whole thing started sometime on February 28th, when firefighters were called to the scene of a blaze in a section of mountain forest in the city of Iwaki. Thankfully, the fire itself was able to be put out. However, it quickly became clear that this was no accident after traces of an accelerant were found. After reviewing surveillance footage from the area, police spotted a car that was parked close to the scene shortly before the fire. That car was found to belong to a 25-year-old man named Genta Kifune. During questioning, Kifune reportedly admitted to taking a can of kerosene into the forest, dousing several trees and igniting them with a cigarette lighter. The reason? The 25-year-old claimed that he was stressed at work, and lighting fires helped to relieve the tension. He was then arrested on suspicion of arson. Several lighters were also apparently found in his car during a search. Though Kafune is now in custody, it appears that the investigation is far from over. Police say that they now have reason to believe that the 25-year-old firebug might actually be behind a series of forest arsons in the area which have been happening since the beginning of this year. Authorities in the Thai capital of Bangkok say that a local man is in custody this week after he admitted to the brutal murder of his ex-girlfriend, who he allegedly killed before staging the scene to look like she had taken her own life. The investigation began sometime on March 18th, when police were contacted by a security guard at an apartment complex in Bangkok's Lat Prao district. The security guard said that he had just been informed about a female resident at the building who he had been told was dead inside of her unit. When officers arrived at the scene, they confirmed the tragic situation, discovering the victim, later identified as 21-year-old Onoran Fon Nawarat. Fon was lying on her back on the balcony of her apartment and had sustained obvious bruising to her neck. A towel was found tied to an air conditioning compressor nearby, with the other end still hanging over the balcony. Back inside the apartment, police found a note purportedly written by Fawn. It explained that she was tired of life and included an apology to her mother. While it was clear that this scene was supposed to make it look like Fawn had taken her life, almost immediately, details apparently did not add up. When authorities spoke to Fawn's mother and showed her the letter, she said that the note was definitely not written in her daughter's handwriting. Even more suspicious was the information from the security guard, who had initially alerted police. He said that he had been informed of the death by Fawn's ex-boyfriend, Natapon Bank Wanasut, who claimed that he had found Fawn hanging from the balcony when he woke up that morning. However, he left the scene before police arrived to investigate. Following further conversations with Fawn's friends and family, detectives learned that the 21-year-old had recently broken up with Bank. She told loved ones that he was abusive towards her, was addicted to drugs, and refused to work. Despite this, Bank had tried to get back together with Fawn several times. When police interviewed Bank, he initially told them that he had been at Fawn's apartment on the morning of her death, but claimed that he wasn't involved. He said he fell asleep at around 3 a.m. and urged her to come to bed. However, she insisted on staying up. He said he found her the next morning and panicked. By this point, though, authorities had reportedly uncovered additional information that poked holes in Banks' timeline. 
A friend of Fawn said that she had been with her until at least 4 a.m. that morning. She also said that the 21-year-old had been concerned about returning to her apartment because Banks still had a key, and she worried he might be there. When confronted with this information, Bank allegedly confessed to murdering Fawn. He told police that she had a new boyfriend and had asked for her key back. Instead of giving it to her, he went to her apartment and waited for her to come home. When she returned, he attacked her and then staged the scene to make it look like she had taken her own life. At the time of this recording, Bank remains in custody, though it appears that formal charges have yet to be brought against him. Officials in Russia say that four people have been charged this week and at least 10 others are in custody following a devastating terror attack at a rock concert that claimed the lives of more than 140 people and wounded dozens of others. The horrifying incident took place on the night of March 22nd at Crocus City Music Hall, a concert venue located in the city of Krasnogorsk, about 13 miles northwest of the capital of Moscow. Roughly 6,000 people had traveled to the entertainment complex that evening and were there to see a show put on by the rock band Picnic. Sadly, that show would never happen, as before the band could even take the stage that night, the situation transformed into a real-life nightmare. Just after 8 p.m., as hundreds were still making their way into the venue, loud pops began to be heard in the building's foyer. Employees at the concert hall would later tell the media that they thought the sounds were from construction work. That was, until they saw a flood of people scrambling to get back outside. That's when they realized that what they were actually hearing was gunfire. According to reports, after storming into the foyer, at least four gunmen opened fire on concertgoers. As crowds of people began to run for their lives, the attackers proceeded into the main venue space, where they continued to attack those who had already made it to their seats. While this caused enough of a panic on its own, things became even more chaotic when the gunmen began dousing the building with an accelerant, which they quickly lit on fire. They then fled the scene while hundreds of others became trapped, either by the crush of people trying to escape or by the rapidly spreading flames. The fire severely complicated the emergency response as firefighters and police struggled to get the situation under control while also attempting to rescue the wounded. Despite bringing in helicopters to drop water from above, the concert hall's roof partially collapsed and it reportedly took 10 hours before the fire was finally contained. Understandably, this greatly contributed to the deadliness of the attack, with the most current estimates putting the death toll at over 140 people. That number could still rise, though, as there continue to be dozens who are missing, as well as at least 60 victims who are in serious condition in the hospital. Though the gunman managed to flee the scene after committing the crime, roughly 14 hours after the attack, it was announced that more than a dozen people had been arrested. Among them were four men who are now alleged to have been the main perpetrators. All of them are nationals of Tajikistan. I'm just going to be honest, I'm not going to be able to pronounce any of these names, so we're just going to put them up on the screen for you. The men were reportedly arrested by Russian authorities somewhere in the country's Bryansk region, about 210 miles from the capital. Almost immediately after the incident, an ISIS-affiliated terror group claimed responsibility for the savage attack. It's now been alleged that the specific group is called Islamic State Karansor, or ISK, an offshoot organization whose goal is to establish a Muslim caliphate across Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Iran. ISK is specifically known to have been targeting Russia over the past couple of years, with counter-terror experts saying this likely has to do with the country's past foreign interventions into Muslim countries like Syria, Afghanistan, and Chechnya. While Russian officials have somewhat acknowledged this theory, saying that extremists were responsible for the attack, so far they have stopped short of mentioning ISIS or affiliated groups directly. Instead, Russian President Vladimir Putin and the country's state-run media have made unsubstantiated allegations that the West is somehow responsible for what happened. In statements after the attack, Putin, as well as several Russian state TV personalities, specifically called out the United States and Ukraine, saying that they were behind the attack. 
In particular, Russian officials have claimed that the terror suspects were fleeing to Ukraine at the time that they were captured, though have not provided any evidence. This is also despite several reports that state that U.S. officials had actually tried to warn their Russian counterparts about possible terror attacks in the weeks leading up to this week's incident. Another area of controversy has been in the treatment of the four suspects following their arrests. When they appeared in court to face official charges this week, all of the men showed signs of being beaten and having sustained serious injuries, with human rights organizations calling out the behavior of Russian police. While much of the situation remains disputed, and the whole thing is still very much a developing story at the time of this recording, one final thing we thought that was worth mentioning was a report about two teen boys who are now being praised for their heroism. The boys, 15-year-old Islam Kalalov and 14-year-old Artyom Donskoy, were working as cloakroom attendants at the concert venue during the attack, and rather than running for cover, it said that they risked their lives to get as many people to safety as possible. In the midst of the panic, the teens reportedly directed people to doors and exits, with some sources stating that they may have saved more than a hundred lives. This week, both of the teens were awarded medals for bravery in a ceremony by Russia's Commissioner for Children's Rights. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you'd consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.